Good evening and welcome to Monday Night Meetup. I am your host, Commonwealth Victim Advocate, Suzanne Estrella. This is a judgment-free space for honest conversation and thoughtful reflection. This conversation is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel at a later date and is streaming live via Facebook. There is no expectation of privacy. You can be expect to be respected. If you have thoughts or comments or questions, please feel free to share them in the chat feature. And my assistant Ashley will be monitoring the chat and let us know and we can try to address those comments and concerns during the program. Tonight we're doing our back to school, kind of take a look at what's happening for uh, sexual assault survivors and victims of crime who experience sexual assault on school grounds or on college campuses. I am thrilled to have so many great advocates and survivor experts here with us tonight. Uh, we're gonna be talking about campus sexual assault, Title IX and some available resources. Tonight with us are advocates and crime survivor, Lakeisha Anthony, who is doing lots of great work across uh, Philadelphia and the Commonwealth empowering survivors. I also have attorney friends, Conrad and Andrea here with us from PCAR's Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project. And we're partnering on this episode with the Shine Campaign and Chris Krishner and folks from Child Advocacy Centers just to bring some light to this important topic and some of the available resources. So I'm going to give each of the guests an opportunity to share about the work that they do and tell us about who they are and why they're doing the work. But before we kind of plunge into that too deeply, I want to just kind of get some general thoughts and some kind of opening framework for this discussion. So I'm going to open it up and allow each of our guests to tell us about what it means to you when you hear the term rape culture. We kind of hear a lot of terms um, throughout the society now, whether it's through social media, um, other different organizations and platforms that have come up with the Me Too movement and just various options, which can be really great, but sometimes there's not like clear understanding of what we really mean by those things. So tonight, let's just start with, and anybody can jump in and answer that would like to tell me when you hear the term rape culture, what does that mean to you? I guess I'll start the conversation. All right. Good evening, everyone. I would say for me, it is a, a place uh, where rape actually thrives. Um, rape culture is the pervasiveness of sexual assault um, in media images and social ideas and cultural practices that normalize and trivialize sexual violence, ultimately blaming victims for their abuse. And it allows for sexual violence to continue to perpetuate itself within our society because there is a culture that says that it's okay or that it's a joke or that it does not really exist. Great, great. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd have to 100% agree. And I, I would maybe just add that it's sort of the common public response to hearing that someone was a victim of sexual assault. It's a victim blaming response that might look like, oh, well, what were they wearing? Oh, well, why were they out at that time of night? Or, oh, how much did they have to drink? Had they drank too much? So it's an automatic, instead of looking at the fact that the person was a victim of a crime and putting the spotlight on the perpetrator of the crime, that the spotlight is going to the victim in a way to try to um, put them at fault for having been assaulted. Yeah, I hear that. Anybody else want to add anything? Or? It's also the ignorance and just lack of understanding, a lack of uh, training when it comes to just trauma that comes with that. Uh, just the way victims are approached, not listened to, accused of being inconsistent when uh, they're still trying to process uh, what they've been through, uh, which then ultimately discourages them. Uh, and that's why the numbers are so low when it comes to reporting 
uh, and sharing their experience. Yeah, that's a good point. At the end of the hour, we're going to share some some resources that people can uh, kind of have to go back to. One of them is a book called um, Know My Name by Chanel Miller. And in the book, uh, a survivor is, um, you know, sharing her story. And listen to some of these quotes that she writes. She put, I didn't know being a victim was synonymous with not being believed. Then I was not used to to recalling mundane things so precisely. Then she also talks about the connections um, between, oh, and some of the other resources, they're gonna um, talk about some of the connections between shame, pornography, and alcohol, and how all those concepts add into the mix. So just throughout that, this discussion, I want us to keep some of those, um, some of those things in mind and think about how we process this and, and what kind of changes do we really need to see to make some strides to making sure that we're actually hearing survivors, giving place for voices for people to come forward in the best ways that we can and what improvements really look like. So I'm going to open up tonight again um, from our panel with uh, Lakeisha and ask you to go first again and ask you to share some of your story with us and uh, as much as you would like to and tell us about how you became involved with this work and uh, some of the things that you're doing. You already know I am a survivor. I am a survivor of both childhood sexual assault and campus sexual assault. Um, my childhood experience was one that I didn't really remember too much of. Um, it was something that I stuffed so far down into my memory that I had no recollection of it until I was in my 30s and I was already doing some of this work. But the incident that really shattered and tarnished my life was when I was a freshman in college. As a freshman in college, I was a part of the track team. I was the third fastest person on the team and I was entering a new realm of life as most college students do, um, hoping that this new realm would be a, a space for me to grow, to learn and to escape some of the things that I've experienced in childhood. And college was that for the for a moment. I was one of those students that started college a little bit early where I went to a summer program and I met some of my very best friends um, as most people do in college. And in that experience, um, I was sexually assaulted after that experience, after the summer, um, I went back to campus uh, kind of like an upperclassman. And in that moment, I was sexually assaulted as a freshman uh, during the first three months of freshman year, which we know in this field of work is the red zone where most, most campus sexual assaults actually happen. I was raped by a football player. I did not clearly recollect what was really happening to me or what happened to me. Um, I found myself returning to my room after the incident, crying, wanting to wash off all of the dirt that I felt. Um, and in that moment, I said I would never tell anyone about this experience and I vowed to keep it a secret. Um, and I kept it a secret and I continued to move through life and even spoke to the individual um, just to keep my friends out of reach so they wouldn't, be, wouldn't think or suspect that I didn't like someone. It was a small campus and I was uh, one of a small group of people of color, of black students. So we all stuck together, we all knew each other. And in that, I wanted to keep this shielded because I felt like I didn't wanna break up the group. Um, and in that, I continue to keep it a secret until around Thanksgiving time, um, I went to the doctor for some x-rays um, and I discovered that I was pregnant. Um, me being pregnant calls for me to, of course, alert my parents who uh, were not well versed in this experience. They didn't really know what to do. Um, and in that I went back to campus after receiving an abortion, because I said I was going to move this situation out of my life and it would never ever be known to anyone outside of my parents. 
I proceeded to go back to school. And when I got back to school, what occurred was um, I ended up having some pains that I did not know what it was. And I got rushed to the hospital. I had two friends that went with me. And in that moment, my life really changed. If I thought that my life changed when I was sexually assaulted, that this was nothing compared to what it was really, what was really happening in that moment. And what occurred was um, I told the doctors what happened. I thought I had an infection. They treated me for the infection that I had. I went back to campus and the next day I woke up to everyone knowing my story, a story that I did not share. I only shared it with the doctor, but there were so-called friends in ear reach. So now I became the talk of campus. And there were so many people who were victim blaming as I know it now. I did not know that's what it was then, but talking about what I did and whether it was true and whether or not he did it or not. And it crushed me and it made me want to sink in a hole, which I did for the next 12 years where I dealt with post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide ideation and severe, de severe depression that I didn't ever think that I would want to even continue to live this life anymore. Um, but through the help of agencies like such as here um, and WAR, Philadelphia Center Against Sexual Violence, I began to recover my voice and I began to started telling people about this story and realizing that I was not the only one. Um, and that's how I got into this work because I recognized the power of my voice. But it was only after the worst nightmare that I've ever experienced being told and I didn't tell it. Um, so when we talk about rape culture and we think about those things, that's a part of it where you're yeah. telling someone's story that they didn't even tell themselves. But that's how I got immersed in this work. And I realized that I could be a difference maker. I could be a change maker by letting people know that you're not alone uh, and you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so, so powerful. We so appreciate um, the work that you do. How about at the time that this was happening to you, were you aware of any resources available to you on your college campus? Not at all. Um, sexual assault was not something that was talked about back then. That was like in 2001. So I don't recall any orientations where they talked to me about Title IX and all of those things that I know now that I'm in the field of the line of work. Um, I didn't know any of those. Um, and then there weren't many people that I felt like I could trust that I could even go to to share and feel, figure out who could help me. Maybe my mm -hmm. coach, um, but in that moment, I don't even know. I think I did say something to my coach, but I don't know if it was clear uh, that I was stating this actually happened. Um, it mm -hmm. might have been muffled or, or, or um, you know, when you're trying to recall or to tell, disclose to someone is a very difficult experience. So there were not um, any resources that I knew of outside of the counseling center. Um, and in the counseling center, I didn't know that that's what I would, that I needed to go to the counseling center if I was raped. Right. I didn't make yeah. that correlation and that connection that a counseling center would be able even to support me. Mm -hmm. What do you think present day are the three most important things that an advocate should know if they're working with a student survivor on a college campus? One that student survivors might, all survivors might not even recognize what really happened to them. They might not correlate or call it sexual assault or rape. Um, most of them might even be dealing with self-blame and feeling like it's their fault. So they won't label it as that. So we have to recognize that what we might label it, that person might not. The other thing it would be that letting them know that they're not alone and allowing them to have autonomy about what happens next. Um, mm -hmm. When you are sexually assaulted, you uh, don't have a choice in the matter. So it's important to ensure that survivors know that they have a choice in what their steps are. Got it, thank you. Tell us about how, I mean, I mean, we're here describing how you were then, but we see how you appear now. And clearly you have taken um, some, you've been on a journey and we can see the resiliency and um, how powerful your voice is today. 
how would you encourage some other um, survivors to build resiliency, to be able to kind of move forward? Um, I would encourage survivors to know that one, that they're not alone. I think that that is a common theme for many survivors where you feel alone. So you don't feel that you can actually get to the other side, that your life is immersed with darkness um, and that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. But I'm a witness that there is light at the end of the tunnel with proper resources, um, with sometimes medication, with uh, counseling services and a support system, um, you are able to reclaim your life, to reclaim your voice, and that there is life after sexual violence. And I think that's the biggest thing. Most people feel like their life is over, and most people want their life to be over. But I say live. There is life after this. Just seek the help. Um, and for those of you that are not survivors, I would even say to support those who are survivors. And you never know when there is a survivor in your midst. So your conversations, your actions that you uh, make and move during this time frame, when we're having conversations about sexual assault, even in the media, survivors are listening. Mm -hmm. And they might say, oh, well, I can't go to this individual because I already know their thoughts and their feelings about this particular experience. And they might not feel supported. So mm -hmm. I would just encourage survivors to find their safe space, find where there are supportive individuals um, and note that there is light after the darkness. All right, that's a powerful testimony. There is life after sexual assault. So I appreciate that. Okay, I'm gonna move over to um, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape attorneys that we have on the panel today and the Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project. Tell us a little bit, um, about the project and you know what is Title IX? It, I want to say what a powerful story. Akisha, thanks for having the courage. And I know this is your work and you've been doing it. It moves the needle. Survivors are listening. Their families are listening. It's so important. Um, and it was powerful to hear you um, describe that tonight. So um, I'm Andrea Levy, and I work at PCAR, the Sexual Violence Legal Assistance Project. And our project that Conrad and I um, work at, we are lawyers and we provide representation to survivors. And our representation is free and confidential. And we do uh, legal work all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in areas where there would not be free legal service available to a survivor. And uh, there's many different types of work that we do, but um, a large part of the work that we do, and especially that Conrad does, is Title IX work. And in general terms, I'll tell you a little bit about Title IX. Um, it is a federal law that protects people from discrimination based on sex in education programs that receive federal funding. So this law, says, it says, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights enforces this law, and Title IX applies to schools, uh, local and state educational agencies and other institutions that receive federal funding. So we're talking about Title IX applies to grade schools, middle schools, high schools, um, VOTEC schools, colleges, universities, and even other institutions that provide education and receive federal dollars, such as um, ones you might not think of like museums or libraries. Um, a lot of times when we hear Title IX, um, we think of it in terms of anti-discrimination with respect to athletics, but Title IX is much broader than that. And one key area that schools have a Title IX obligation is to prevent sex-based harassment. And that includes sexual assault and other forms of sexual violence, including the treatment of LGBTQ students. Um, 
It's also important to realize that schools cannot retaliate against an individual for asserting any right or privilege that they have um, secured by Title IX. Um, so to keep talking in generality, so what would an example of a Title IX violation be um, in the context of sexual violence? So it could look like sexual harassment. It could look like sexual assault. It might look like bullying based on gender or sexual orientation. It would include unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, um, verbal, nonverbal, uh, physical conduct of a sexual nature. And the Office for Civil Rights uses the term sexual violence to mean sexual harassment. And when OCR, that's what that office is called, refers uh, to sexual violence, they're talking about, and this is sort of technical, but a physical sexual act perpetrated against a person's will or where a person is incapable of giving consent. And as we just mentioned, that can apply to a number of um, different acts, including rape and just about any type of sexual assault that you could imagine. And this could be a sexual harassment, sexual violence carried out by um, an employee of the school or college, like um, a teacher or um, a faculty member against a student. It could be carried out by one student against a fellow student. And Title IX even sometimes applies to a third party in certain cases that um, commits an act of sexual violence against a student. So when this happens and the college or university or school knows or reasonably should have known about this sex-based harassment, it has to take immediate and appropriate steps to investigate what occurred. And if the investigation reveals that discriminatory harassment created a hostile environment, the school is required to take prompt and they call it effective steps to reasonably calculate it to end the harassment, eliminate the hostile environment and um, to prevent it from reoccurring. So that's just the general idea of what Title IX is, who it covers and for the purposes of sexual violence, um, how it might apply. Right, so knowing that you guys can't reveal any details or anything like that, but just kind of um, in general, what does that look like for a student um, to say, because you know, now we know that we're in that, that heightened time period where we see a lot of um, sexual assaults happening on college campuses, particularly for freshman students. So if something like that happens to a freshman student, um, you know, what can they do and what do they get if they do it? Like if they say, okay, I want to do this Title IX thing, um, what does that look like for them? And then what happens as a result? Like, can you give like some examples from the cases that you've seen? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, good evening, everyone. Connor Jarzina, and uh, uh, staff attorney, as Andrea mentioned uh, here at PCAR. Um, <clears throat> so the first step would be to uh, just going on your school's website and just uh, finding who the Title IX coordinator is on campus and uh, trying to contact that person as soon as possible. It can be done directly, probably just stopping up, stepping by at the office or uh, most of the schools these days uh, have just website based ways to contact the Title IX to, to, to report um, what happened. And um, once uh, a report is made, uh, I think it's important to emphasize whether there is a formal complaint filed or someone doesn't even want to pursue it. Uh, everyone should know that the school is required to provide what's called uh, supportive measures. Um, and those can include a variety of things and uh, it really depends on the individual, but it can be academic accommodation, uh, just like rescheduling of a test, uh, maybe getting some extra time to, 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 to prepare for a test, uh, could be asking for uh, campus security to walk someone from building to building or you know, from, from class to, to the dorm, um, could be safety planning, just uh, could be uh, requesting uh, change of housing, Although with cases, I typically like to ask the school uh, 
to change the housing of the perpetrator. I just don't see why why someone who's been assaulted needs to then really just, uh, unless it's impossible or just not practical, that would be my first request. Move that person away. Uh, make that person go in line with classes if, if they are in the same classroom if possible. Um, so so school the school is required to provide those supportive measures, again, regardless of whether a complaint was filed. Uh, if someone says, I don't want my name released, I don't want to pursue it, still entitled to those. But if uh, if one decides to pursue the case, then basically after a uh, complaint is filed, report is made, the school is, uh, will inform the perpetrator, uh, provide the notice of the allegations, uh, most of the time issue a no contact directive while the investigation is pending. And uh, uh, either the school will have their own investigator or investigators, or they will, uh, they have some third parties who they will retain to investigate. Um, and then uh, while the investigation is pending, uh, each survivor and uh, respondents for that matter under Title IX are uh, allowed to have advisor of choice. That's when a lot of times we come in uh, and the advisor then can guide that person through the whole process and can be just, you know, just, just talking, participating in the interview with the investigator um, because once, once the investigation is concluded, uh, you, uh, there is a preliminary report issued that you can review with your advisor, make comments to that report, can sometimes provide some additional information, so some additional additional evidence. Um, you can ask the investigator to uh, maybe interview another witness that has some pertinent information that, that is important to the case. And uh, once you once the period to submit comments um, closes, then the final. Uh, report is issued, and at that point, the uh, uh, hearing would be scheduled. And once that's scheduled, uh, then uh, they will appoint a, or pick a panel or one person to to hear the case and issue make a decision. So, so that sounds really complicated. It sounds really complicated. Is the, how does that differ from them? You know, calling the police. Like. Yeah, well, yeah, one, how does it differ? When you call the police, uh, I mean, it's just in reality, I mean, just procedurally, of course, then the local police would, would have a detective or someone who basically does it for a living, uh, who will also investigate. And, uh, and uh, but in those cases, you do not get to a lot of times review the report. You, a lot of times you are not, uh, you cannot participate this actively in the investigation you basically you're interviewed they will do an investigation and uh and they will or will not inform you of the next step they you know a lot of times uh these investigations just kind of nothing happens with these investigations uh, other times there will be charges filed but but uh um but but the, the, the main difference is that you, the investigator in a criminal case will be looking at the case differently because in criminal cases, you have to prove the allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. It's the highest standard of proof that we have in the legal system. Uh, most of the colleges will have the preponderance, preponderance of the evidence standard, which is basically just to illustrate it, you just have to show it like 51%, you know, or tip the scale slightly evidentiary scale, if you will, uh, towards you to be able to uh, to prove the charges. So uh, um, the, another difference that, you know, you ask about experience from cases is that Title IX cases, at least we have people that receive more training. Uh, there's more trauma training when we deal with uh, law enforcement, nothing against law enforcement, but but the training is lacking. And 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 uh, and a lot of times individuals that go through that experience come out of it even more traumatized because of some of the things we already mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. And, and sometimes, you know, it, like Lakeisha was saying, it's about empowerment and some survivors aren't going to wanna to report to law enforcement for a number of different reasons. They might not find it to be safe. That might just not be the outcome that they're looking for. Um, they, they might not feel trust in that system. 
um, but it's more appealing to them to use the school system to try to obtain some sort of accountability. So it's another level of choice and empowerment. And I just have to really emphasize what Conrad said, the level of trauma-informed practices is much greater generally at the college, university, or school level um, for the survivor. Okay. And then how could a survivor get assistance from, from you all? And is that, do they have to have an attorney? Do they have to have an attorney? They do not have to have an attorney, but we would strongly suggest that, uh, that, that someone does have an attorney in that process. As, as, as you noted, Suzanne, uh, this can feel overwhelming and complicated. The rules are changing uh, all the time. With new administration, we usually end up with new rules and you have to just adapt. And, um, and, and you also have to be prepared that the perpetrator will have an attorney or will have, have an advisor. And, and then you don't want to go through the hearing, you don't want to go through this whole process, just uh, being intimidated by that uh, or silence. For, uh, that's, we don't want that. Uh, uh, we don't want anyone giving up through the process because uh, because of that. And and um, to answer your first question, I'm, and I don't know if there will, there will be contact information for SV Lab, but, uh, but anyone is more than welcome to contact us, go through the intake process as soon as possible. We'll try to uh, assign an attorney to that case and, and, and speak to the person again as soon as possible because those cases move pretty quickly and uh, we want to get involved uh, sooner than later. And uh, just another thing I think that's worth mentioning as far as, as VLAP is that we do not have any income requirements. So you don't have to, it's, it's we, we, we take clients regardless of, of their income. We don't ask for it. Uh, it's not something that uh, is used uh, as a criteria for, for our representation or us getting involved. Okay. And then can you tell us a little bit about what does a win look like? If the person is as a result of a Title IX case, um, what would a survivor, what are some expectations that, okay, you won, what does that look like? Yeah, that's, I guess in our field, that's a philosophical thing. A win is all of us being unemployed, right? Uh, and, and having no more work to do. Uh, we let, and by we, I mean everyone in our project, it's just me, it's just we, we, let, we let our clients to define that. Uh, some of the, some of them just want their, they don't even care about that quote unquote win at the end of the process after the hearing. They just happy to see, to be able to get the strength to call someone out, to make them go through this process, mm -hmm. to make them go through this hearing. Uh, you see a lot of cases where, where, where the moment the report is made, the other person drops out or withdraws from school. Uh, and that's already, you know, that's already something, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, other clients, uh, yes, that they want to, they want to prevail at the end of the process. They want the perpetrator to be held responsible and, and, and face uh, consequences. And as far as sanctions, I mean, we see a variety of sanctions. Uh, uh, you have suspensions, you have just expulsion. Um, we, one case comes to mind where, where the perpetrator was semester short of graduating, where he was expelled, found responsible, expelled, and uh, all of the credits that he has earned to date were uh, deemed not transferable. So basically mm -hmm. his entire, you know, three and a half semesters of school were wiped out. Um, uh, a lot of times too, when, especially in the cases where someone drops out, um, and, and, and you, you start to feel as it gets close to the hearing where, where client just gets really nervous and anxious and, and, and starts really going through a hard time psychologically. Uh, I often suggest reach, reaching out. Well, that's when we would reach out to, to the other advisor and see if we can basically try to work something out and, 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 and reach an agreement, which typically would mean that person withdraws or remains unenrolled, never steps foot on campus, never steps foot uh, even at any school activities, whether they're on or off campus, never accepts employment, 
at that school uh, as a contractor, any other you know form, and uh, and we doesn't happen often, but they can think of a couple of cases where, where it was effective because again, when you know as you get close to the hearing and those hearings aren't in person, uh, they're usually virtual or you can you, you can have that option. Uh, it's still a lot of stress that you know trauma and everything just mm -hmm. just just builds up and then you read the report and you read all the lies in the reports that are basically thrown your way uh, and and uh, it, and it can be you know can be very uh, emotionally exhausting but again that's not the reason to give up because there are other options and we always try to present those to to our clients great we have a question in the chat um, someone's asking if title nine applies to high schools and would that include hazing involving sexual assault like the current case at middletown high school the simple answer is yes. The Title IX is not only college, you know, colleges, higher education institutions, but K twelve. So it does apply. There, there are little, and even hazing if it's if it's of, of sexual nature. Again, this is probably like a typical lawyer answer. It depends, but but in in general, uh, yes. If it's of sexual sexual nature, then uh, the Title IX could uh, kick in. And uh, the, the only difference is that at the K-12 level, they do not hold hearings uh, necessarily. So you basically go through an investigation, there is a report, you can comment on it, and then uh, someone reviews it and will make a determination. Uh, colleges, you basically have a hearing and, and, uh, and go through the process and then the panel or, or the uh, decision maker will will issue a decision. Okay, and someone else is asking, is there a statute of limitations on Title IX cases? The statute of limitations in the Title IX cases varies with the state because it's basically uh, state specific. Uh, I believe in Pennsylvania, it's six years. Um, it's basic, that would more apply because when we deal with, with Title IX cases, that's at an administrative level because you have these administrative, you have this administrative process, or you could sue for money damages under Title IX for Title IX violations in federal court typically. So that's when you have to worry about the statute of limitations. Let's say it's been years since you graduated and, and, and you felt you feel that the, the, the school didn't do what it was required to do. Uh, the cases we usually get is students who are still enrolled in, in, in statute of limitations. It's just not, not an issue. Yeah, I would also note that Title IX says that schools can dismiss a report if the respondent is no longer a student or if the respondent was an employee is no longer employed um, at the school or the university or the college. So it says they may, colleges colleges or the institution may dismiss those types of um, um, claims. And so if they're older, it's a pretty sure bet if, if the parties aren't, or especially the perpetrator, alleged perpetrator, and they call that respondent, is not there, that, they're, that the institution would not go through jumping through all the hoops and, and all the resources that it takes to do an investigation might be um, uh, a safe bet. What do you think, Conrad? Yes, absolutely. And we, we run into it a lot and that we're very sensitive about it because sometimes these investigations, some schools just do it by the book and these these investigations really go quickly and and uh, and and you have a hearing and it's two months, three months later, the case may be resolved. So this is other schools which you know I'm not cannot say they do it on purpose, but uh, but there are delays, 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 and then all of a sudden you find out mm -hmm. someone graduated, even if the school doesn't dismiss, uh, but someone graduated, you feel like there's not much the school can do at that time because you know they already an alumni. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know what 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 can the school you know this whole sanctions part just really loses its teeth. So uh, and same with complainants, you have to be enrolled in order. Uh, for the school to have jurisdiction, especially under these new rules. So, so, um, so also have to be careful because basically the moment you graduate and you want to report the following day, uh, school 
will no longer look at it as a Title IX. However, that's also not the reason not to report because then the school could still look at it as a non-regulatory uh, matter and still proceed under uh, student conduct. So just because there is no Title IX jurisdiction doesn't mean that uh, then the school cannot do anything. And, and, and we run into these situations where we then proceed under student conduct and, and policies and sanctions sort of tend to be similar, just uh, the procedural requirements a little different. Well, that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that to our sure. attention. Chris, I did not forget about you. Tell us about the Shine Campaign and the work that you all are doing at the sure. Child Advocacy Centers. Yep, the Shine Campaign is a, is a sort of a, an awareness campaign that we are running this summer to shine a light on the courage of child victims of sexual abuse to come forward and talk about their abuse, but also to, to shine a light on the issue of child sexual abuse, which um, we, can't, we can't tell the stories of the kids that are seen at children's advocacy centers. Um, CACs, as we call them, respond to reports of alleged child sexual abuse in partnership with law enforcement, child welfare, prosecution, medical providers in their communities to ensure that kids have a child-focused response, that they're not interviewed many different times in many different settings by many different people. Children's advocacy centers are child-friendly facilities. Um, they coordinate that investigation. Um, Suzanne, you mentioned you know, shame and blame and all of those dynamics that come along with um, sexual abuse and sexual assault. And that's why Children's Advocacy Centers were founded. Uh, we've been around for about 30 years. And in the early days, the prosecutor who founded the first center had a case uh, with a little boy. And when the prosecutor went to prepare him for his um, testimony, the little boy said to the prosecutor, why don't you grownups talk to each other? I already told this story. I already told what happened oh. to me. And he also noticed that um, multiple interviews in different settings by different people with different levels of training on questioning children created problems for his cases. Um, so the first CAC was started in the late 1980s and we now have 40 children's advocacy centers in Pennsylvania. Um, we have about 20 counties that we're working to develop children's advocacy centers. And we can't, we can't tell the kids, uh, the stories of the kids, the thousands of kids who come into our doors every year. We can't tell their stories. Um, you know, we need to maintain confidentiality. But we want to find a way to just talk about the issue. Um, and, and so, Adult survivors who were um, victimized as children are willing to step forward and, and talk about their experiences and talk about what, you know, what got them through and what resources and support they needed. And they're helping us to really shine a light on the issue and give us an opportunity to talk about sort of the depth and breadth of the problem that one in 10 children will be sexually abused before their, their 18th birthday. And, you know, kids continue to delay disclosure. They don't want to talk about it. Um, very few cases have medical evidence. Children are still made to feel like it's their fault. Um, again, I said this already, but different agencies respond and have to question the child. And um, that creates all kinds of challenges, not only for the child, but for the investigation. So at a Children's Advocacy Center, we have specialized forensic interviewers who will question children while law enforcement and, and children and youth watch through a mirror or on closed circuit TV. We videotape those um, interviews so they can be used later and reviewed by the, the agencies or used in court if needed. Um, we make sure that kids get medical exams, even though most cases don't have medical evidence, it's important to make sure that, that there is an exam and that kids can be assured that they are okay, or if there is evidence to treat the, treat the issue or to, um, and to um, perhaps use that evidence to make decisions about prosecution. Um, we have victim support services for caregivers. Caregivers are often overwhelmed and 
uh, often the perpetrator, as we all know, is someone known to the child. And mm -hmm. so, so victim advocates provide a lot of support. And then, and then we work to, to try to make sure that every child who might need long-term um, trauma-focused therapy will have access to it as well. Whether that some of those services are provided at the CAC by CAC staff, and some of those uh, services are provided by partner agencies, including the rape crisis agencies across Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So SHINE gives us, again, an opportunity to take a stand against child sexual abuse, to, to talk about it, to shine a light on it, to bring survivors together on behalf of children who are haven't yet disclosed or are thinking mm -hmm. about disclosing or are in the process of disclosing. And we still have a long way to go. I think you highlighted at the beginning some of the challenges that we face in our society, whether it's rape culture or whether it's just, um, you know, requiring um, child victims to convince everybody that that they were um, they were sexually assaulted beyond a, a reasonable doubt. Um, mm -hmm. And so so that is that is a challenge. And so we work to support kids to give them the best opportunity to talk about what happened, to get the resources that they need to support the non-offending caregiver and the and the family members and um, and to help them move forward so that that the abuse doesn't become a life defining event, whether there's a prosecution or not. Um, you know, there are not a lot of prosecutions in these cases, partly mm -hmm. because of that burden of proof and and some of these dynamics. So that's why we think it's really important to, to do our best to have, um, you know, a response that includes uh, trauma focused long term therapy to help kids and families heal. Awesome. Awesome. The campaign is so well done. I love the way it just um, brings a face to the numbers. I think sometimes we can get so accustomed to hearing the numbers, one in four, one in 10, that it kind of loses the meaning of where we're talking about people, actual right. people and, and children and way more people than we should be talking about. So being able to see those videos on the campaign really, um, really helps to, to bring that out. It's very impactful and very powerful. And I'm, I'm hoping that it will just be a really great um, prevention tool even mm -hmm. as more and more people listen and um, share those videos. Yeah, yeah. I think our CAC saw about 10,000 kids last year in Pennsylvania um, for allegations of sexual abuse. They also see allegations of physical abuse, but not as many. Sexual abuse mm -hmm. is, the, is the reason CACs were started because of of those dynamics of disclosure and investigation. So thank you, um, that, that is what we're trying to do with that campaign. And again, we can't tell our kids stories, but they are, they are heart-wrenching stories. They are little kids. Um, a lot of them don't even really understand what, what happened to them. And the more we can do to shine a light on the, the issue, I think the better. And we also do need more prevention programming across the state. It would be yes. great to see you know, prevention programming in every third grade or fourth grade in Pennsylvania. We do have prevention programming. It's, you know, it depends on the community that the child lives in, but we don't, we don't reach every child in the mm -hmm. state with sexual abuse prevention um, mm -hmm. work. Yeah, awesome. So we've come so far, but there's still, like you said, so much work to still be done, but so happy for um, the people here tonight who are doing this, um, impactful work. Now I mentioned that we were going to um, share some resources and we are we are going to do that but I want this is um, as a quote it's like three questions and I'm going to read it and then um, let you give a comment and this is from a book called Sexual Citizens but I think it kind of speaks to um, Chris what you were just saying. This is what kind of society produces people whose feeling about their own right to sexual self-determination is so impoverished that they spare someone else an awkward interaction, even if it means having a strange and unwelcome penis inside of them. What kind of society produces people whose sexual projects ignore the basic sexual citizenship of others? And what kind of society produces spaces that don't discourage this kind of behavior, but
but that instead seem to facilitate it. So that kind of just leaves it with, okay, how are we going to create safer, caring communities where justice thrives? So I'm going to ask each of you, what are the top three items on your wish list that you think are necessary for us to create safer, caring communities where justice thrives, where we're no longer that society that facilitates sexual assaults? I'm always asking, like, why are more people not outraged about child sexual abuse? Why do we say the numbers about how much money people are spending on child pornography and there's no, like, where's the outrage? So you guys tell me what, what top three things would you say are on your wish list to bring about some changes? You know, we, I, I'm gonna come at it from the perspective of, of the Children's Advocacy Center, which I, I understand is after the abuse has happened in many cases, right? But we really need to have CACs accessible to all kids across the state. Um, we'll sometimes hear from caregivers in counties that don't have a center and they'll say, I read your website and it sounds like that would have been a fantastic response for my child and we didn't we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that would be one thing. And then again, availability of evidence-based long-term therapy and mandatory prevention training across the state. That doesn't necessarily get at your question about how do we create a society that doesn't sexually assault kids to start with. And, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that, although I hope that by telling survivor stories and shining a light on the issue, um, we are doing our part to say this is not acceptable. Definitely. Thank you. I guess I'll go. I'll piggyback off for Chris um, and also state statewide uh, prevention education mandatory. We know that they offer it via the centers that are across Pennsylvania under PCAR and both under uh, the CACs, but mandatory where it is law that all children, because I feel like that will create a better future because now those individuals who grow up will not begin to commit sexual violence but because of the prevention efforts that are made in that room. The other thing I would say um, is to remove rape culture. Um, and how do you remove a culture that has been created? Uh, the other thing I would state is to create a more empathetic environment in society. Um, I think that we operate in silos um, and that it's time for us to come out of silos um, and begin to do the work together as well as for the community to band together, to, to, uh, to ensure that we have more safe environments. It takes, it takes more than one individual. It takes us yeah. rallying together um, and being committed to the mission of seeing a better society. I and agree. also to show the dignity, um, to recognize that there is dignity and difference. Um, which will allow for us to come out of our silos and be connected together um, on a deeper level. If we could actually honor the differences of others, but also work and band together to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I would echo what both Keisha and Chris said too. In one way to bust rape culture would be through education. Um, if people understood that delayed disclosure is the norm, not just when children are sexually abused, but when anybody is sexually assaulted, that is the norm. Um, that does not um, indicate some sort of suspicion on that person. 
um, or some form of manipulation is going on. It is the norm, delayed disclosure. If everyone could be educated on that, that would be great. If everyone could be educated on traumatic recall, for instance, the neurobiology of trauma, memories are encoded differently under traumatic events. Survivors are not going to be able to give a linear recall of things that happened to them. That's an adult survivor, let alone a child, let alone a child. So we need to normalize and educate, and it's based on science, how these events are described in a delayed way and, and sometimes in a way that's disorganized from how our normal memories are stored. If the public in general had this information, I think it would lead to more empathy um, that Lakeisha mentioned. And you know that's why we need to start by believing. You just believe the survivor. There are very, very few false reports of sexual assault, um, statistically speaking. There's been data on that over and over again. It's no greater than any other crime. Um, so with you know, these little bits of understanding, like perhaps there could be some change in our culture and understanding what survivors are going through and what they have to go through. Thank you, I agree. Can I add one thing? I also sure. want to speak that for people to recognize that no one wants to be a survivor. I think that people have a notion that being a survivor is like a badge that someone wants to wear and wants to, to carry that banner. Um, there's not one survivor that I know that wants to be a survivor nor would wish this on their worst enemy. And right. I think we need to recognize that um, and make that normal that no one wants to be a survivor. Yeah. I agree with everything that was said. The thing I'd like to add is also the just allocation of resources. So, Suzanne, you mentioned like child pornography. Um, you know, I can type in Nissan Altima and Google today and tomorrow it will be all over probably my Facebook page or there'll be advertising and all this stuff. Um, marketing people can get these algorithms, figure out basically everything about you, what you like, what you prefer. Um, we have the technology to find someone in a cave in Pakistan, you know. Uh, I just... It's, I also say it when it comes to like school shootings too, which is not, you know, it's a little different, but just like, why can't we use those resources, that technology that we're so lucky to have today um, to be able to just at least get rid of that part? You know, there should be absolutely no space online anywhere for anyone to be able to access it. And if someone accesses it or posts or shares, uh, we should be able to find that person. We are able to find that person. We're able to find those individuals. Uh, but again, it's just about allocating resources. So, you know, uh, and, and, and that's part of the culture because we'll go after, you know, drug dealers, we'll go after terrorists, we'll go after all sorts of people. But for some reason, this is like a blind spot uh, that we just need to get rid of. Yeah, I agree. Ugh. I agree. Well, we are almost at the end of our session today. Um, Ashley is posting um, the resources on the Facebook Live. She had some technical um, difficulties with getting it up on the Zoom, but um, the number for PCAR's Legal Assistance Project is 717-901-6784. Um, the Shine campaign is at pencac.org backslash shine. And then um, the books that I uh, was talking about is Sexual, Sexual Citizens by Hirsch and Khan, Know My Name by Chanel Miller, and I Have a Right To by Chessie Prout. I believe that's how you pronounce that. 
So for more information, please check out those resources. We also want to acknowledge that every survivor's journey is unique and that there's no one um, right way for uh, restoration from a sexual assault. But we hope that this conversation and these resources and just sharing um, this information helps um, some along their journey. And if you need assistance, please feel free to reach out to uh, your local rape crisis center. Um, the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape is a center serving every county throughout the Commonwealth. If you need assistance finding a support group or some other type of therapy, uh, feel free to reach out to the Office of Victim Advocate and we can get you connected with some resources that are close to you. But thank you so much to all of my guests tonight for sharing this time and this space and this conversation. And thank you for the super impactful work that you do. I am hopeful that through individuals like yourselves, we will um, come out of our silos, collaborate and work together to create safer, caring communities where justice thrives and dismantle things like a rape culture. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we will talk again to our viewers next month. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley.